All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, can we just start off with some introductions? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, about your role. Uh, Peter, let's start with you. Sure. Um, my name is Peter Oberst, and um, I've been uh, in this industry now for nearly 40 years, the last 30 or so in medical device. My role in this organization right now is to uh, work with the applications group. We put the proposals together for new equipment projects. Uh, we're trying to balance risk versus uh, value uh, to their clients and wrap the business proposal around the technical solution and uh, so, so make an attractive um, offering to our customers. Perfect. Uh, Bill, can you go next? Sure. Um, I'm Bill Tramberg. I'm the Director of Controls Engineering. Uh, so I'm responsible for the group that does electrical design and uh, the, the, the program that goes into the automation, motion control, robotics, machine vision, data collection, all that. So I've been uh, with the organization for 12 years. I've been in machine building and um, going back roughly 30, 32 years. Perfect. And John? Hello. I'm the... Director of Mechanical Engineering at Essential Technologies. Um, I've been in the industry about 40 years. And my primary responsibility is for the Mechanical Engineering Group. In, we handle the process development for automation and the machine design development and uh, documentation. Excellent. And last but not least, Errol. Yeah, hi. So my name is Errol Ayrturk. I'm the Vice President of uh, Engineering and Product Development for Instruments and uh, Consumables. Uh, so yeah, my team's developed the, the instruments and the design the consumables that uh, these guys do a great job of automating. Perfect. All right. So I've got a series of questions for you to sort of guide us through this deep dive um, to sort of share um, what to be mindful on as people are considering how to use automation uh, or how to scale automation going forward if they're already using it to some extent. Um, so to start off with, what are some of the trends that you're seeing um, in uh, performance testing and adjacent tools? Is there more scrutiny uh, being being required in that area? Uh, are stakeholders that you're working with wanting more visibility into what's being delivered? Um, can you give us some examples of what you're seeing in that area? Maybe, Peter, if you want to start. Okay. In medical device, uh, pharma... Um, equipment, it, it all starts with a user's requirement specification. So the users develop these specifications that determine how the machine performance is supposed to end up so they know what they're buying. And these user requirements are, uh, we, we start with those and we create um, other design documents that follow our design development and our machine development. Uh, it all kind of ends up together in what we would call a factory acceptance test, where the customer would come in and measure the machine performance against their requirements. Uh, this is a um, an, an event that um, has you know takes on different forms depending on which customers we're, we're dealing with. But the the major tra change that I've seen over the last ten years or so is that instead of one project manager or project engineer coming out to buy off a piece of machinery, now we get a whole committee of, of um, project personnel that come out, each have their own specialty and each, each have their own area that they're checking to verify the machine makes um, what they, what probably was their input into the requirements to begin with. So, so I guess that's probably the biggest change I've seen over the last few years. Mm -hmm. John, do you have any other examples or does, does that match with what you've seen? Um, I would say uh, I would agree with Pete. That certainly has happened. I think the other thing that goes, goes with that is as we move into, you know, further into the information um, and, you know, analysis of things, the need for condensing that information into useful, I'll say, outputs. You know, so where before it would be, well, we're gonna we're gonna do some sampling offline. Now they're moving this sampling online, and they want to 
they want to have that continuous feedback. And not only do they want that continuous feedback at the machine, they want it at their desktop, which means now it's, it's you know, something that our controls group needs to deal with on the information transfer away from the machine. And so, Bill, do you agree in that? Space. Yeah, I definitely agree because um, that um, evaluation and checkout of a system isn't just an event anymore. It's ongoing, um, not just um, in, in, in overall performance, but in a very granular way for different sections of the machine. So that, that data is generated almost continuously. And once it's generated, um, we, we have to have ways of, of, of visualizing it in a coherent way so that people actually get information out of it. Great. So how about um, the move towards robotic technologies or the growing interest in that um, and sort of machine vision camera systems as well? John, are you seeing that have an effect on simulation capabilities in particular? Yes, I would say on, on the, the trend towards, towards robotics and I'll say reuse modularity would maybe fit into that space too of uh, customers are looking for a faster turn on bringing things online, modularity, robotics, you know, vision systems of the common platform are all enablers of bringing that to light. Um, and it also allows maybe a, a more universal platform. Um, you know, some of the simulation capabilities that started out as individual, I'll say, you know, you could have a simulation of a robot it's hard to have a simulation of a pick in place, but the technologies are now there to bring the machine together, to bring that simulation into uh, a whole cloth simulation rather than just the simulation of individual devices. And, and that, plays a, that plays a significant role, not just in the mechanical, I'll say deployment of the equipment, but also the checkout of the equipment. And Bill, I'll kick that to you again. Well, I mean, the simulation has an impact along the whole life cycle, right? Because during development, simulation enables us to do testing uh, before we have a physical machine in front of us, right? And, and we can test concepts and we can vet ideas that way. Even after a machine becomes uh, complete or it goes online, simulation of that same machine, a, a digital twin, is, is going to enable us to do improvements and uh, testing of specific situations without disturbing production. So being able to do that in parallel is going to be pretty uh, pretty helpful as well. So Bill, are you seeing uh, more customers lean towards using you know, more, more advanced, more capable robot systems rather than uh, straight pick and place machines? And you know, why is that? Um, and how does 3D vision play into that as well? Um, sure. I mean, you know, robots come in handy in a custom environment because uh, the, the companies we work with need things relatively quickly and they need it to be flexible. Flexibility of a robot is is a, one of its advantages. And we can always build a pick and place out of discrete components, but it's pretty limited in its, in its abilities. And when things change and they always change, it's much more of an impact. So robots in that regard, um, you know, helpful in this environment. The 3D vision, you know, that, yeah, that, that technology continues to improve. And we've used it a number of times for profiling quality inspection in conjunction with robots. We use it to navigate, um, you know, parts that may be different every time they run through a machine. And we work with companies where we're not making thousands or millions of one single thing. We have to process parts that may be different every time out. They're made to order or whatever situation is. 3D vision is one of those let us build a automatic system that can adapt to whatever comes our way. And I think, you know, it's a, maybe a, a simple observation, but the 3D vision allows us to combine inspections. You know, imagine that you're, you're placing a component in, in, in prior applications, you would maybe need to verify that that component was placed and then have some measurement device to say that it was placed correctly. And in 3D vision, you get that all in one shot. You take the image, 
you know that it's there and you also know that it's in the right place. It's, it's seated correctly or oriented correctly. Those things all come in a single package now, which is, which is helpful for throughput and, and space. So um, with some of these newer manufacturing technologies, robotic technologies, um, are they ready for the additional rigors of you know, fields like medical device manufacturing and life sciences where there's you know, additional requirements put on the manufacturing environment? And which, of them, you know, which kinds of systems might uh, be easier to get going in that environment you know, in terms of the risk versus reward? I think it's a that's a re- it's going to be a very relevant question um, in regards to AI and machine learning, um, not just in their capabilities, but how the entire process works. Medical anything working in medical is going to be a validated system. The nature of AI is that it it adapts and it changes. Well, how how do you validate that, and how do you maintain that validation if the machine's logic itself? can evolve over time. That's going to be an interesting thing, um, how that. So I think, that is a technology ready? It certainly adds a lot of capability. Is the world ready? Because um, in, in a lot of ways, outside of automation, but in general, um, we're going to have to figure out how to make that work within you know the broader context of whatever it is we're doing. I think maybe I can add uh, uh, to that, uh, Bill. I think in the medical world, the OQ, IQ, PQ processes to validate, as Bill was talking about, will only be enhanced by having more inspection capability that's automatable, where you can verify the actual specifications of the consumable. Uh, And being able to verify the specifications and tracing it back to the requirements is what FDA cares about. Uh, More of these tools that uh, the team is talking about will only be make it more effective. Now, these tools have to be reliable and they have to work uh, reliably, but I, but I think we're at a stage in the industry that those, those bugs and error cases can be, can be worked out. So now you're, valid, you're validating the outcome and that's really that, the only thing that matters. Yep, that's right. And I think, I think the, the challenge is navigating you know, the, the risk, right? I mean, FDA is, is wanting to know that these systems have the risk contained and you're not presenting something that's going to be detrimental to their cust- you know, their customer, their person that's receiving this product. And, and in some cases, the, like AI, it can help, it can help us find, um, I'll say correlations that, that we maybe wouldn't piece together, but to evaluate those correlations, and say, yeah, you can go forward with this and have that be um, evolving after you're done with uh, validation. That that piece is still, I think, in in a neophyte stage of saying, how do we deal with how do we deal with that? But the power of those tools certainly accelerate our ability to understand processes, understand the interactions. And, and make evaluations in in that space, and in the 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 tools that we were talking about earlier, like the robots and the and, and the vision systems, looking at the capability that a three D vision brings. Now you've got a you've got an image or a process that you're you're looking at it from one perspective, or I'll say one one tool to give you the perspectives that you need rather than multiple tools, which makes it easier to, to process that information. And, you know, Errol, I know we've been talking, you know, development of, of vision capability, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly expanding, right? I mean, yeah. And getting, getting, I'll say more capable at, at less cost. Absolutely. Yeah. Instruments contain a lot of imaging, a lot of optics and a lot of sensors, uh, whether it's when you look at molecules, tissue, uh, or just uh, pictures of larger things. We, there's a lot going on in the instruments that can be uh, also uh, leveraged into the consumables that the, the automation is handling and um, inspecting and testing. Absolutely. So, um, backing up a little bit on uh, AI and machine learning, um, could you maybe, Bill, could you outline a bit more what some of the value 
um, value is that these kind of new approaches can bring to, you know, inspection and process development technologies? Yeah, I mean, it, it's helped in, in a few ways. I mean, in the context of machine vision, you know, machine learning based systems are have been helpful to uh, make inspections that may not translate cleanly into very discrete tools, right? It, vision systems always been good when you can zone in on one area, measure it, count pixels, recognize a pattern. But if the, the inspections are a little more subjective, that's been difficult. Machine learning, you can put 100 good ones, 100 bad ones in front of it. It's going to make those associations um, uh, to be able to, to distinguish between you know, a failure and a, and a, and a past uh, product. It's also um, going to be helpful with things like predictive maintenance, where you know, um, a system will track various performance parameters of devices or an entire system over time and, and, and kind of um, um, detect disturbances or even some degradation of a parameter to anticipate a failure before it actually physically happens. So those, those have been uh, very helpful. And I, I think, you know, in the process development world, it's been very helpful as well, right? I mean, the, the correlations that, that we make um, in, in how the process is supposed to work, understanding the inputs and the outputs. Um, you know, AI can assist in identifying where, where there might be associations that we wouldn't necessarily pick up on. They, you know, they don't always pan out that they're real, but they point you into a direction of things that maybe we didn't see before. So it's, it's helpful in, in that regard. Yeah, you're talking, John, you're talking like patterns that would be recognized over time that you, you couldn't see just by watching a machine run. Correct. And what you're looking at? Yeah, right. I mean, and, and even when we have the data, when we have the data in front of us, sometimes you just get lost in the data, right? It's hard to see and process all these things and, and getting that into, you know, into, a, I'll say, a matrix of data that can be analyzed outside of how we would necessarily do it, it may find, it may find correlations that we wouldn't expect. And, and not that they all pan out, but it points you into an ex exploration that says, all right, let's let's go look at this. Is this real? Is this is this tangible? Is this something we can can act on? Errol, do you guys have some? I, I'm kind of leaving this off to the side. I don't know. Are you guys getting into into using this in your development for instruments? And you know what what platforms do you guys have? Uh, specific to uh, AI and vision, uh, I, I think the areas that for us. Data, you guys talked about this a little bit, uh, data management and, and connectivity of uh, what's um, what's being produced. Uh, so tying a consumable uh, to uh, a consumable that goes into an instrument, a patient sample that goes into a consumable that's barcoded uh, that can be tracked through the instrument where the uh, logs of that those results uh, are kept and uh, uploaded is all very important. And on top of that, analyzing that um, smarter analysis techniques via a a AI are going to be vital in terms of uh, uh, analyzing instrument health, determining false positives, false uh, negatives, and minimizing those. Those are all very important for our, uh, manufacturers of uh, consumables and, and, and devices. Um, so, yeah. Uh, those things are becoming more important, as and so uh, we have to collaborate more between our automation and uh, the instruments to be able to handle and manage that data and present it properly. Um, there's a lot of at the application level. There's a lot of uh, imaging analysis that's very smart. It's being done at the molecular level, at the tissue level, uh, and uh, spatial genomics is where a lot of this has been happening already. And uh, yeah, it's only going to get more and more important. Um, and, I so. and I think you know to to leverage that, and maybe you would, maybe you would. I guess I don't know if you'll agree with this statement, but I think one of the things that 
I've seen also is that as we generate these consumables, there's a, a desire and a, a need to track the manufacturing parameters of those yep. consumables down to the individual piece part so that when it gets consumed at the instrument level, it knows you've got a way to get back to that history to know if there is now some underlying manufacturing issue that's contributing to an error yep. in, the, in the consumable. Absolutely. Yeah. Chain of custody is also is not just important for like HIPAA requirements, but it's important for managing uh, the whole workflow uh, and keeping costs down, actually, overall in the uh, in the diagnosis and therapy. So, yeah, absolutely. So because a lot of these technologies are so new, particularly some of the AI and machine learning stuff, but even uh, you know some of the robotics and machine vision stuff. You know, in many industries, these are you know fairly recent innovations. I guess there's a tendency for them to be sort of afterthoughts or bolt-ons, or you know, how can we improve a process with these? What are the technologies that actually companies should start to think about earlier in the development phase, like when they're starting a product design or a process design um, activity? And what are the benefits of sort of including some of these from the beginning? rather than adding them later as a bolt-on to a more traditional process? Yeah, so uh, maybe if we just take a step back and, and think about how the innovation happens for a second. So uh, a microbiologist or a biochemist or uh, some scientist has a, has a uh, workflow to detect some, something of interest in a sample, in a, in a biological sample of some sort. Uh, that's where the IP is for the manufacturers. Now that that has to be developed into something reliable, repeatable, and it can be used by people like technicians and uh, operators. That is the job of the instrument. The instrument is kind of the brains that we design. Uh, but the, the main part, the business end of the instrument is actually the consumable. You know, there are instruments that sit on desktops that are point of care. Then there's instruments that uh, they take days to run. Uh, some consumables are low volume. Uh, and they're very costly. Uh, they may hold a very complicated piece of brain tissue, and others are just a blood sample or a urine sample that uh, in a couple of minutes you gotta you gotta produce a result for five bucks. Um, so it's this. Uh, so when you're in this world of developing this new new workflow, uh, new chemi chemistry of some process uh, through the instrument and the consumable, there are many factors companies consider, and automation. Um, uh, automation is critical. The problem is most of the uh, most of the time you don't get to the automation part of it uh, until you've produced lots of things and you've 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 now become in a great position to now automate more. But all the decisions that are being done uh, to make something uh, easier to automate and uh, and, and more reliable and repeatable, many of those decisions are being done up front. Um, so I think probably the most, so to, to the economics are how well you automate the consumable, but upfront design when the scientists are formulating, they just wanna make a few of these, and then they wanna make a prototype that can automate those few. Uh, so I think uh, collaborate, this is gonna sound mind, mind numbingly simple, but, but upfront collaboration and uh, working with Folks who understand automation early in the design is a is a critical piece, and having uh, a company that can understand obviously all those elements are critical. So, but but for example, uh, what we do early in design of the instrument and the consumable is we we do what we call design FMEAs, which is like okay, what can go wrong uh, with this design? Making something work one time uh, with a consumable and an instrument on a bench top is 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 difficult. But once you do that, what you need to do is make sure you can test it. You think through what can go wrong. Um, and you also have to make sure that it's usable, uh, usable by patients, by, you know, so that the sample can be collected properly and the machine can be used repeatedly by the lab technician. So all these, um, and there are lots of tools out there. So there's tons of pressure sensors, bubble sensors. Uh, you can check surface chemistries of your consumables. There's lots of tools out there. Uh, we already talked about vision. 
deploying the right tools to be able to get repeatable and reliable results is really important. Um, along the way, when we develop, the other important element is we'll make a few instruments and a few consumables. Once we get that working, then there's a rush to make more to get them in the hands of people. Now, uh, having an understanding of the capabilities within automation earlier and bringing those conversations into, into the design are extre is extremely helpful. Most people can think, you know, oh, uh, I'm going to make this consumable. I'm going to put a tube on it. And I know if I, I I'm just going to put some features on the tube so I can read the cap and, and I'm going to make this rigid. The, the, the assembly aspects of consumables, most people get. Uh, what people don't really uh, think through is how to test it, what can go wrong, and what things can we put into the design of the consumable uh, to mitigate those such that when it comes to time, come, comes time to automate, we can do them fast and uh, reliable. I don't know. I would if add to that. I would add to that, Errol. You know, the, oftentimes the experience is where we have uh, our our need or the customer's need to come to us and say, we're, we're at this stage. We've, we've done the manual bench. We maybe have some automation, you know, semi-automation done, but they're, you know, they're just on the cusp of getting their FDA approval. And when that happens and the, the material feeding to the line that needs to happen, and, and they haven't anticipated that these got to be fed from bulk or they've got to be in trays or they haven't made those considerations. Now the automation part becomes expensive and difficult and maybe not reliable because what a human can do with, with our tactile feedback, our eyes, and, and that's not necessarily what an automated machine can do. We're, we're certainly advancing um, some of the technologies in that direction, but it's really that consideration. So, you know, to go back to the original question of, you know, what what is the the challenge and how could this be done different and how do you deploy these technologies? It's really, as Errol was saying, that upfront engagement, that knowledge transfer at an earlier point so that the hooks are in place when you want to start scaling. Granted, that's not the first need, right? The first need is to get to a consumable and an instrument that's working or, or, a, or a product that's actually working and they can say this makes sense to make further investment in. But it's that, it's that collaboration up front to, to get the design for automation incorporated before you're going for your FDA approvals. That's a, a piece. And, and some of the things, you know, some of the things we don't need the most advanced technologies, but in other cases, applying these advanced technologies allows them a space to go automate that, that is, you know, allowing them to put features in that they maybe didn't think they could put into the, the product. That's exactly right. The classic analogy is, uh, you know, the world's been making PCAs for a long time. Putting test chips and uh, putting test points on PCAs is a very common uh, thing to do. It's well accepted. It, you, you you make a board and, and you test it through these uh, pins and, and it's going to work every time. And and I think thinking through what type of uh, things can go wrong and, and putting in some hooks to be able to test things is just as critical. And there's there's so much technology out there that we can deploy with those things. And, and a lot of them could be common between the ins what the instrument is doing with the consumable and how the uh, 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 what the automation would be doing to build up the consumable. And that's, I mean, that's true at you know, the work cell level too. In any manufacturing system, you've got to make the process measurable. Um, and you've got to do that in a way that isn't wasteful in other words, it, what, what measurements are relevant? What do you really need to measure? And a good failure analysis is part of that. You know, what what do I need to really look at to make sure the process is, is running properly? Um, you can create data. You can create a lot of data. Doesn't mean you're, you know, you're selecting the right data. You can have a lot of useless data 
where you could be missing key elements within a process that could help you track the nature of a failure or the, the quality of a process itself. So changing tack a little bit, uh, another sort of classic benefit of process automation is being able to scale without relying on uh, skilled labor, essentially. Um, obviously, the uh, landscape in the labor market has changed quite dramatically, since, particularly since the pandemic. How, how have you seen that shift in terms of you know, what companies are looking for in the way that they sort of deal with their uh, sort of workforce requirements? And you know what are what are some of the ways that automation solutions and you know newer trends like AI can help with uh, reducing the need for highly trained, highly skilled uh, workforce that can that can be a concern in some of these sort of technical process processes. Well, I mean, you know, previously, uh, certainly pre-pandemic, if if a, if a problem occurred in the field with the system, you'd put someone on a plane, send them out there, have them go service it. Now that you know that wasn't a possibility then. So it forced everybody to develop ways of supporting systems remotely, um, assisting uh, users remotely. And, and that's kind of taken off. And even you know, post-pandemic, uh, people have seen the efficiency of being able to monitor a system remotely, uh, not just to collect data, but to assist in troubleshooting without having to put anybody you know, out there on the spot. Okay, I'll answer it from a, a front of the business kind of uh, perspective. Um, before, uh, the pandemic particularly, um, I was always, it was always difficult to justify the, the cost of automation and not, I sh shouldn't say always, but in most cases, simply on labor savings reductions, you know, you just do the math and the math still don't, d didn't, didn't end up that way. If it was solely based on saving bodies. Uh, there usually there, there usually had to be some other factor like uh, improved yield, or improved quality, improved throughput, throughput um, material savings. Something else needed to be. Sometimes repetitive motion uh, injuries also w were calculated into that. Um, today, in today's market, uh, I, I I'm not getting that as much because. The, the employees to do those jobs just aren't available like they were before. So that, that's one thing that I've noticed since the pandemic anyway. Right. And I would, I would add to what Pete's saying is the, the lack of those resources being available, the, the, the manufacturers are, are looking at options, right? And they're saying, well, I needed this level of skill before. Can I, if I, if I reduce the level of skill that I require, does the pool get bigger? And generally the pool does get bigger. So then they're faced with this problem of how do I, how do I bring this person that is maybe not as skilled as what I need to a manufacturing piece of equipment that has some complexities that they maybe don't understand. And, and they're turning to us as the manufacturers of that equipment to start bringing some features that make that transition possible to a less skilled workforce. And it, and it manifests itself in some of the things AI, but it manifests it in like the training that's available on the machine, right? Access to access to videos that maybe were pre-recorded. But in order to do that, how do they get access to the right one? And that that starts requiring that we have to put smarts into the equipment to based on the the error functions that we're getting, what is it that this person likely needs and have some of that predictability to say, oh, based on these combinations of errors, you need to see this information. And that makes it, that makes it more complex. That makes it from a, I'll say from a information management standpoint, but it enables the, the client to use a less skilled labor force and still get their output. I agree with, uh the people aspect of it. And I want to add on to something that Bill was talking about. One of the things that uh, pre-COVID, 
that medical device medical uh, device com- companies in that business uh, w- were very averse to letting their data go out. Data security uh, and uh, keeping their information systems in house uh, was a big deal. Uh, they didn't really need the change. Um, and I know there's been a lot of uh, internet theft and break-ins and all that, but but the COVID really forced companies, uh, medical companies, to change. They are much more willing to work through cloud uh, system software and also uh, sh- allow uh, data to go outside their uh, DMZ, their their own networks, and that's allowing us to connect in. Uh, to instruments uh, as well as uh, the systems that that are being built, much more so than they ever did before. And I think the the, the fact that people couldn't come in the office and they had to still work that was a big driver in forcing a cultural change in the mindset of uh, keeping their data all close together. To add to that, I think there, the duration of it was long enough that people saw that it could be done with reliability, right? I mean, and pandemic stretched over years rather than just a, a short time period. So it it's gotten some proven case um, studies to say, yeah, this works and, and we can continue to do this. I want to address, I mean, the, the idea of how, you know, we're implementing technology in a way that accommodates a changing workforce as you know as we get older and we're we're being supplanted by you know, the younger workforce we're looking at the, the fact that you know uh, newer workers have are accustomed to interacting with their technology in a certain way the interfaces you know graphically i mean we we, we put together interfaces you know up till now in a fairly static way with menus and and, and widgets and things and and now we're looking at things, little interface cues like, you know, pins to zoom and, and ways that um, operators can navigate a system to get more information out of it um, and understand what's going on. That's, that, that's, that's changing too. The, the technologies and the software is accommodating it, but it's also kind of required because people just have different expectations when they walk up to a screen of how it's going to work. Yeah, you, you do expect a touch screen. Almost every time you look at a, a monitor these days that you can touch it and you can move things around. So it's a good point. And how does that uh, play into as well, I guess, the other sort of big trend in the last couple of years in manufacturing, which has been supply chain issues. Um, and a lot of companies looking to shorten supply chains, simplify supply chains, um, moving back to onshoring or nearshoring some of the, you know, some of the manufacturing um, what changes have you guys seen, you know, in in that area, and how do some of these people issues and some of the technologies play into that as well? well certainly, the supply chain has had an impact, right? I mean, the the delivery of components that we used to take for granted, um, you know, we could we could predict we're we're likely going to be short on on these components. The supply chain is certainly, I would say, shifting back towards something more reliable, but there's still surprises on simple components that you wouldn't think would be a supply chain issue. Now now a $10 part is holding up uh, a line of getting getting a major component made that we need to put in our equipment and and they're stuck, right? Which means we're stuck. And now how do we how do we adapt and change? And you know, when we when we get to that it it's um, can be very problematic. So that hasn't that hasn't gone away. Um, the, I would say we've definitely seen the supply chain become more skillful in navigating that. All of our suppliers are maintaining options for us um, to. All right, we don't have these. These aren't going to be available in the time frame you need. Um, Rather than just saying no, we don't have it. Now they're they're the expectation has changed that if you don't have it, what's the what's the next option? So I'd say it's caused the supply chain to be more flexible than than maybe they were previously. And to help with that, you know, we 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 tend to leverage open standards and field buses and things like that 
that really make it a lot easier to make a substitution once we realize something's not available. If some part's not out there, but it supports a particular field bus, it's a lot easier for me to find a replacement than if it was something that was strictly proprietary um, uh, with no options. Well, I would say that uh, the, the complexity of the supply chain, because it's globally understood, the people who put in the right strategies, such as using more commonly available open source components um, uh, from more available, uh, you know, microprocessors, win Windows, uh, using Windows as opposed to some esoteric version of uh, Linux, or uh, if, if we're using more of those, then we're going to be able to differentiate uh, because uh, replacements and jumping through uh, the escalations will be easier. And the manufacturers of the end products are going to appreciate that because they all feel the same pain. So it can become a source of differentiation if, if, if designs are appropriately thought through with the supply chain in mind. And what about uh, multi-platform interaction? So is that a, a growth area that you guys are seeing? And what are some of the benefits that are you know, driving manufacturers to pick that up? When I heard this question, I, I was thinking about it in, in the terms of, all right, we have an assembly, we have an assembly system that is doing the, the work and what are the other things that go around that? Well, there are multiple platforms that go around that, that we, that we interface in, right? So we've got, we've got SCADA and data management. We've got simulation that they want for predictive, predictive, um, you know, changes. They're, they're looking for a whole cloth. They're looking for a whole cloth solution, not just the machine anymore, right? They're, they're wanting us to extend into their business systems to make sure that we're meeting them at the interface that they need. And I would say, you know, certainly we've seen that on simulation. It's, it's long been a trend in, in, in data collection and in management, but Bill, I think you're seeing, you're seeing a, a higher demand for, for pulling that into the equipment build. Well, sure. I mean, you know, We've talked about data and how things are connected more um, extensively than than really they ever have before. And you know, the wider your domain, the more variety you have to deal with. Um, so that you know, this even the even a machine we put in a factory no longer um, just interacts with the data system; it has to interact with adjacent systems. So I've got different control platforms. I've got different software systems. You know, we find ways to make them interact. And that goes back to relying on open standards, um, um, field bus standards, anything you can do to, you know, find that common interface between components. And I think anything that we can do to give them the information that they're maybe needing for the problem at hand, you know, whether it's accessing, accessing the latest performance data or I need the performance data the last time this product was run, being able to get to that quickly or documentation that would, wouldn't, they, they need it to show up on the HMI rather than having to go look at another computer that the interaction and the interface between these multiple systems and the communications, getting that information to show up where they want it on the screen at the same time, I think is certainly uh, a need that, that is maybe not completely stated, but but desired. Sure, and that's that's part of most projects is uh, you know that we're building to um, a specification of what that interface needs to look like, right? I mean, you, every every unit, every component is going to be different in its implementation, but you know we'll work with companies who have that common interface defined so that um, individual work cells and components can fit into the overall system cleanly. And, and I would say the, the customers, you know, we've, we've got a relationship with um, medical device um, customer, longstanding relationship. And when we talk with them um, about what it is that they're, they're looking for, you know, they're starting to specify in their URS is that they need a digital twin. That's not, it's not uh, nice to have anymore. 
it's a need. They need this digital twin and they're, they're looking for that digital twin to give them, you know, I'll say a multiplicity of channels on which to evaluate some of the challenges that they have, right? This is what we're getting for performance on the equipment. Yeah, we've got our manufacturing floor focused on that, but who's actually looking at the solutions and how do those solutions get deployed without interrupting that production while the digital twin is an enabler and the potential standardization of some of that code so that when you do develop that digital twin, the, the rules that are applied to this area of manufacturing are consistent. So they're, they're starting to get some standardization of how they get that feedback, how they do that analysis, how they can deploy that vetted solution before it's actually on the machine. And that's where a lot of the data collection comes in handy as well. I mean, if you're going to run a simulation, it really helps to have a lot of data about the context of a particular um, performance um, issue. And having that data available, um, turn it right back into the simulation and, and come up with a solution there instead of being online. Great. So maybe as a wrap up, guys, um, in terms of the... Uh, the conversations that you've been having, the the kind of questions you get, uh, what would you say is the sort of biggest overarching theme or trend um, in you know manufacturing automation that maybe you've seen uh, in 2023 way more than in 2022? You know that you think is going to keep increasing. Like, is it something we've mentioned and talked about? Is there something we've missed? You know, or is there something broader? What would you kind of sum up as? Uh, the, the main sort of trend that's that's going on at the moment? Data collection is certainly important, not just in what you can collect, but what you don't need to collect. I mean, we the, the process of identifying relevant data points, bringing that all together into something coherent um, is being continuously developed. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with analytics is, is data is available now and the tools are available to do analysis on the data, which is very powerful. The other trend that I would say is that uh, the amount of therapies, uh, tests, and technologies being developed, uh, whether it's for cancer or for some specific disease or to understand, better understand um, some biological specimen, it's, it's exploding, which means that the number of consumables um, and the chemistries and the things that need to be automated are also growing, and they're all over the map. And I think I think... Uh, being able to uh, look at designs and make them more standard or understanding what tools can be used to, to test them and produce them uh, is only going to be more and more important going forward. There's just many scientists all around the world, not just all our, our universities here, but all around the world doing very incredible stuff that's going to end up in some kind of consumable that is ideally automated so that no hands are touching it. It's aseptic, it's sterile, and it goes right to the patient or the doctor or the scientist's hand just when they need it. So I, I'm super excited about the future. I think to leverage on, on that is one of the things that is happening is as they develop these therapies, some of these therapies I'm going to say are tailored to the patient. The, the days of the days of it being, all right, I have one therapy that applies to the to the full marketplace of people that are going to consume it. That's, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing on the automation side anyway, that the batch size of what they're running is becoming smaller and smaller and the ability to actually want to tailor the, the device to a particular um, patient that that's a trend that I think is going to continue. And that means there's traceability, all these things that have to be at a much more robust level than just tracing a batch. I'm gonna take a more macroeconomic uh, uh, answer to your question. Um, I, I really think uh, I've been seeing it lately. I think others, uh, others in our industries have as well. But onshoring of these types of uh, or nearshoring is going to be more and more important coming up. 
And, um, you know, with all the geopolitical things going on and who knows what's next, I'm just seeing a lot more where customers are bringing um, manufacturing of these types of particularly consumables back into North America. And, and I think we'll see that more and more here in our markets anyway. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your time. That was really interesting. I hope everyone watching found it interesting as well. Um, there'll be a link uh, on screen and down below in the description uh, if people want to learn more or they can request a free one-day workshop uh, to talk about um, manufacturing automation kind of tailored to their needs. So thank you all again for your time. That's been great. Thank you. Thank you.